Learn to be super successful. Subscribe to my channel, me head. From a cold call, one of the kids. He's buying, let's see. Average revenue, 16 million. Paying 4.8 times EBITDA. Cybersecurity. 4.8. They're expecting more than five. So if it's 4.8 and more than five, that deal has to get done because they're in the ballpark, but not 20 times. Press with the board. Realize that in the last six years, their growth has been mediocre. Although these guys didn't suffer during Corona. Their uh, cybersecurity business didn't suffer during Corona. Cold call. It's a numbers game. Now, I got this this morning. Attended the uh, July 2018 seminar. This couple. Went to hardcore in January this year. You can read it for yourself, can't you? And what about you? What have you done since the summer of 2018? $137,000 watches and Rolls Royces are in everybody's cup of tea. I understand that. But the ability to do it and wanting to do it and spend is everybody's cup of tea. Not necessarily a watch or a Rolls but something. Maybe it's to uh, uh, take care of your mother. <clears throat> or I mean, something, you know? But to have that choice, the difference between myself and virtually everybody except one person, only one person that's come to the seminar, actually two persons, that have come to the seminar in 27 years, I've had infinitely more choices then. One, in 1996, um, the bastard great-great-great-great-grandchild of a pope came through here and he lived in a palace outside Rome, 300 rooms, blah, 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 blah. He didn't think this was such a great place. And he had probably more choices than I did. And then a guy, a senior guy from one of the big drug cartels in Colombia, who came through uh, uh, in the late uh, 2000s, in the early, uh, late 90s, in the early 2000s, he came through a couple times. Uh, and they were making a, like a billion a month so he had a lot of choices. But other than those two guys, and both guys were, I mean, they were Renaissance men. Bon vivant, raconteurs, every, they, uh, uh, both of them spoke four or five languages, uh, went to the finest schools in Switzerland, da 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 da. They were, you know. Other than those two, I've had more choices as an adult, not as a little kid, than anybody that's ever come to the seminar, other than those two. And, um, and neither, well, depending on how you want to look at it, whether the, the drug guy made his money. Uh, but I know the, the, the bastard kid from the Pope didn't make any, he just got the money. But if I had it to do over again, I would rather have been born my parents multi-billionaires. If I had it to do over again, I, I would rather marry money. I would. Fat, like the job of the hut, just sit there, get away about 800 pounds and eat. I still live a long time with my jeans. And we've had a, bless you, we've had a half a dozen people over the years that have married big money because they join a club you can't afford. Four or five of the guys have uh, met families, multi billionaire families, and married into it. But they weren't going to be in that social economic milieu on their own, you know, going to Starbucks and, uh, and Taco Bell, like they were before. They joined the club. I had a young man come to me and uh, he, uh, he said, uh, 
uh, you know, I, I think I'm in love. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm in lust, but, you know, th this girl wants to marry me, blah, blah, blah. And, and um, well, you might know their name. And I go, no, I don't know any Packard. You mean like Hewlett Packard? She said, yeah, yeah. Her father's ambassador, to, uh, U.S. ambassador to Russia. Well, get on a fucking plane and go marry her. I mean, what, what, what are you, a moron? Are you brain dead? I mean, I mean, thank you. There's nothing to think about. There's nothing to think about. And I was in the wedding. I was part of the wedding party. And we're going through reception. You know how you go through reception, shake everybody's hand, that kind of shit. So we're going through reception, and uh, Ambassador Packard's here, and then the married, who's the father of the bride, and Ambassador, but the Secret Service all over. And one of the, one of the girls in the wedding... Uh, she goes, as she uh, passes and passes her Packard, she grabs him by the balls. Secret Service, everybody's running left and right. She said, I always wanted to know what a billion dollars felt like. <laughs> Ambassador Packard is dead now. When he was alive, I didn't tell that joke, but he, he's gone long, he's long gone now. But Hewlett Packard. And he had some of the same kind of stories as um, Steve Jobs. You know, they started in the garage, blah, 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 blah. Um, the, um, like sex, the seminar, everything comes at the end, okay? For those of you that, you know, don't touch me, haven't uh, been around your significant others. And uh, I, I alluded to it about preparation, and I was always the most prepared guy in the room, uh, and, uh, and I was. And I said the ones that were the closest to my preparation were the Germans. The Germans. But I was even more prepared than they were. Um, and when you go out and you start holding yourself accountable vis-a-vis -vis the weekly report, and if you choose to have your, for those of you that have employees, um, make them accountable, your whole life will change. And for those of you that want to get rid of employees, just uh, give them the, the tightened version of the weekly report, not a loose up, loosened version, and you will have people leave in droves. Within a month, at least 50% of your employees will leave. And that's only, not, some will leave the day you give it to them. The very day. People that have been with you 20, 25 years, your cousins, your mother, whoever. Well, you know, they're thinking, well, I mean, why is, why is he making me accountable? We're the same blood. He doesn't, they don't articulate that in words, but that's what they're thinking. Or I've been here 18, 20 years, and why am all, all of a sudden am I being held accountable? Most of the employees that you have, and yourselves included, some of you think you have 5, 10, 20 years experience. You have one year, 5, 10, 20 times. Most of your employees haven't learned anything in five years if they've been there five years. You haven't really learned anything new other than this in the last five years. Because we're in a rut. We may not feel uh, like it's a depressive thing, but a rut is a coffin with its ends knocked out. Doing the same thing over and over again. Um, the... Um, but the, the, the Rolls Royce guy, John, uh, he's an aerospace engineer. He's got a master's in aerospace engineering from UCLA. Uh, he couldn't spell M and A. And the rest is history. But and he's, he's Chinese. Uh, the uh, but you're thinking, we got one, at least one aerospace engineer in the group. That's right. Bonsoir. But that's him and not me. If I showed you your, in a virtual world, your twin brother doing this, that's him, that's not me. Unless you believe. Now, when you believe, as we've had some real nerdy, not imbeciles, I call them imbeciles, but I mean real nerdy people come through here um, over the years that have gotten wealthy because they believed. 
for whatever reason, some portion of my bullshit they hooked on to. They were able to resonate with. And again, the only benefit I believe, I don't think going through all these webinars is any benefit at all to me. It doesn't make me a better teacher, it doesn't mean anything. But the only benefit is that I'm one of these people for you to resonate with. Well, if she can do it, or if he can do it, then God damn, I ought to be able to do it. Now you heard Gerard, the criminal defense lawyer, say uh, he had quit. Now he says I don't know, didn't know he quit. Well, when they just when they stopped showing up in those days when, when we have a monthly Zoom, I know that they quit. And then he saw on one of the Zoom calls one of the real, real nerds in the group who was doing deals, and he said, as you heard him say on on the screen, "Fuck, if he can do it, I can do it." That's not why we show you the webinar as well, if she can do it or he can do it. But of the 12 or 15 that you're going to see by the end of today, um, one will resonate with you a little more than others. Even if it's only a part of their persona, you resonate with But That's why they're doing it. Uh, that's, that, that's why we're showing them to you. And today, uh, EJ, who do we see today? I say, now he doesn't look like a Malaysian pimp. You know, Joe, Dr. Joe, Peter, the hotel or the hospital magnate. Okay. okay. And Josh Kim's final, uh, not hurrah, but I, uh, talking to a seller, potential seller. So we've got Dr. Joe, uh, vascular surgeon, uh, and we've got uh, a final one with Thomas. And um, and who's the other one? Peter, the um, hospital magnate who made thirty-five thousand euros a year. Now thirty-five thousand euros is no money, right? Isn't it no money? Can you live on thirty-five thousand euros a year? Well, I'm. With, most of you are going no, but the uh, thirty-five thousand euros is better than no euros, I guess. That's the only difference. Thirty-five is better than no none. Um, and then uh, the case studies that we'll do after lunch, case study one and case study two. And I show you two case studies because I show you how it should be done, and then I'm going to show you how you're going to do it. And you're going to have the case study right in front of you, and you still won't do it that way. And I'm going to show you a compilation of what most of you do. You don't do everything wrong. You do just enough to get the deal done but not, and that's why I don't give out case studies, and that's why we don't do that. Because I've been, and I've been doing this long enough, including teaching university, the kids only memorize the numbers from case studies. They don't memorize the thought process that's behind it. And that's why your dream team that have done, done at the very minimum, 100 deals between them, or hundreds of deals, because they know how to get the deals done. Now, last night you saw Andrew Carnegie. Not my namesake, but I, I, I can't begin to tell you how I felt, uh, not deja vu, but uh, uh, a kindred spirit when I'm walking through the halls of Skibo Castle and sitting in the chair as he allegedly sat in, but I hope they got new furniture since he was there 120 years ago. Um, but it was, it, was, it was gratifying, and walking around the grounds, and, and uh, Sally and I are both thinking, well, shit. We cut the lawns better than this, and our flowers are nicer than this, and our wall garden, yada, yada. Okay, you had a question before I start pontificating. Yes, um, because our, we, we have our weekly reports. Correct. Can we share it also with our chairman when we, we get them? Like, okay. No. And the reason I say no is because you'll fuck it up. And you're not giving him the weekly reports. Your the weekly reports for you, and you are giving them uh, outcomes, desired outcomes. I want to grow to be the largest healthcare provider in North America. Let's just say that that's your deal, okay? Which is a pretty big deal now. Rick Scott accomplished that 30 plus years ago by building 
Columbia Healthcare, the largest healthcare provider in the world at that time, with 300 and some odd thousand employees, uh, 82 hospitals, blah, blah, blah. okay, and uh, made himself a billionaire in seven years. So the Rick Scott model that people talk about isn't the Rick Scott model. It's a QLA model, which is really the Andrew Carnegie model. But now, you know, all these years later, it's a Rick Scott model. You call it whatever you want. If you do like he did, that did, I don't give a fuck what you call it. But that's the model that Peter followed. He followed the Rick Scott model. And he's now, in a couple of years, the second largest healthcare provider in Hungary. And he's moving out from Hungary to other parts of first Eastern Europe and then regular Europe. So getting back to your question about the weekly report, the weekly report, and I, I highly recommend you fill out the information for the weekly report daily, because you won't remember unless you really take copious notes or unless you're German. <laughs> you won't remember seven days later. So the weekly report is really better prepared on a daily basis on a daily basis. And there's about 65 questions uh, when you drill down to the whole report. And I said this on the first day that you have, to, uh, you have to answer. Did you do it or didn't you do it? And when you don't do it, I tell you to put I cunted out. And when you look at the report and you have 40, 50, 60 I cunted out, it obviously means you didn't work the report as it should be because there should be very few I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Uh, there should be very few. Not column after column after column after column. Now, historically, if you're not uh, completing the weekly report by the second week, the first week, people, well, I, I'm not used to it, blah, blah, blah. By the second week, every week that you can't comply with a weekly report, increases the odds of you not being able to successfully complete a QLA acquisition. And I've seen bastardized weekly reports that the kids send me. And um, there's a reason why it's long. And the section at the bottom, basically the report is, what did I do last week? What do I plan on doing next week? Challenges, problems, and then the very last section is, what am I not telling myself? What am I hiding? What am I, you know? And so those sections of the report can be as long as the whole report itself. Because you know what you didn't do. And again, the reports have always been just for you, even though, you know, in the past, he used to send me the report. And then I wouldn't say anything. And you'd write me back, especially him. Didn't you get it? And I don't answer. Then you write me back. Didn't you get it? So if I don't comment, it's because there was nothing negative or positive that I wanted to say. But at most, I'd say in big red pica, 30 pike type, keep pushing. Practice more, or keep pushing, that's your report. Practice more. Make more calls. Because I would drill down and see, based on my experience, why did the, he not get the results he should. Now, if you're, only, if you're only making five cold calls a week, it's easy. Now, you've heard them comment in the webinar, three or four different people, they said, you know, I made 10 or 20 calls. You didn't hear anybody that's successful say, I made hundreds of calls in a week. I don't use those webinars because you won't believe them. I made 200 calls a day this week. You won't believe it. So we don't even show them to you. We showed you the ones that are successful, and I have a big enough portfolio of successful kids. I can take kids out that just did enough to be super successful. And that's what you've seen so far. Even Andreas, who made 1,613 calls, and it's, it was really not, he gave you slightly bad information. 
Five deals came to fruition after 1,613 calls. The 2,000 calls is to make your first deal. He had five deals, of four of which he did. So if you want to divide those calls by four, but he thinks, and rightfully so, because the reporting is for him, not for me, that it took him 1,613 calls uh, to get those four deals. So the reason why you don't want to share those reports, uh, the report that you fill out with uh, your board, even your chairman, is because you're judging them not by the information you're putting down in the report. That's how you judge yourself. That's your leadership tool. Now, can you have a, a, a watered-down report for the board? Absolutely. And I recommend that, watered down, uh, based on outcomes. And that, that's what it's for. But it's a great management tool to get rid of sorry employees. Because you, you probably, maybe none of you believe that employees will quit on the spot. They will quit on the spot. Because they'll know the gravy train is, is done. I already told you a couple days ago, you want to take control of a company that's got a lot, a lot of employees, fire somebody the first day you take over. Do you make a mistake firing somebody the first day? Yeah, sometimes you make a mistake. But is it overwhelmingly positive for, the, uh, for your ability to lead? It's worth whatever feathers you ruffle. No matter who it is. But I like to take the number two sales guy. I don't like to blow out the top sales guy. But the top sales guy is probably arrogant. He's been doing like the fuck he wants for the last several years. So he's not going to listen to you anyway. So you may have to fire the top guy. Okay, Andrew Carnegie. What's the takeaway about uh, the little guy? Yes, sir. Find uh, Mr. Thomas for uh, his, another father figure or mentor. Yeah. There's not much written about uh, his father other than uh, him taking him to, uh, to the United States. Yes, sir. Just to follow that on another level, his father, um, when it came to uh, the United States, he, his father was still poor and a failure. And Carnegie was only a teenager and already a success or on his way to association with success. And in that moment, I think there was a handshake or his, his father held on to him and said, I'm really proud of you. And Andrew just kept going. He didn't slow down and, oh, Dad, I'm moving on with my life. Please, I'll, I'll come down to the third level with you. And there's an abandonment of the biological father. It's just move on. And that was at 19 or 18. I told you that the only time my father was ever here, he asked me while we were standing under the big chandelier in the drawing room, just tell me it's not drugs. And I said, it's kind of like drugs, Dad. It's oil and gas. Because he didn't, couldn't relate to anybody making that much money that quickly. Uh, and, um, but your parents, who I've said this a couple of days ago, are already, wrongfully in my opinion, are living vicariously through your successes. Now, one or two of you have had some successes, so you've made your parents proud. But my dad wanted to make sure that everybody knew that I'm, I'm extremely proud of my son, happy for his success, but my son is successful not because of me, but in spite of me. My dad didn't want to take any credit. And as I told you a couple days ago, I told him because of the character building and that kind of thing, is one of the main reasons uh, that I was successful. And I was always kept my word, and you know, and uh, as Jer Jerome, uh, Jerome said, uh, I always walked high, acted like a man, blah, 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 blah. And all those things translated to and validated and supported my leadership style. And so I had, uh, plus I was a young army officer, that couple, which had a lot to do with my success, because I knew how to lock people's heels. Lock people's heels mean stand them up at attention and scream at them even if they're 40 years older than I was. I could lock fucking heels as a young 21-year-old. And the more heels you lock, the better you get at it. But, and this is again is on YouTube, um, you know, I didn't know what a million dollar was uh, uh, until I was uh, almost 22 years old. I didn't know how many zeros it had. I had never, now, with my hand where, I'm, where my heart should be, I never heard the word million. 
for my first 20 years of my life. I never heard the word million. And I was going into the officers club at Ramstein, which is the premier officer club in Europe, for NATO, and uh, everybody's drinking, and they're drinking, uh, you know, uh, and I asked somebody, and I've, I've said this before, why are we all drinking? He said, free drinks, Dave inherited $1.4 million from his grandmother. And I said, could you please write that down on a napkin? And I still remember, I can close my eyes, and you know, and, and the napkin was a little wet, and so when he's putting the one, he's tearing the paper with a napkin, you know? And then he put a comma, and then four. Fuck. That's the first time. I was almost 22. And then I said, well, we better fucking drink. I mean, somebody's buying, I mean. Okay, I know enough about that, so let's just drink. And of course, drinks are cheap uh, in those days. And then, uh, during the time, same time frame, a few weeks later, I won an award from uh, NATO. Uh, I saved in Fortran, which just coming to the, the language, Fortran for computers, big computers. I knew nothing about, about computers, but I came up with a way to, uh, to store the computer data. Because they used to store computer data on trains, because if we went to war, we, we didn't want our computer data in a room or even in a bunker. They used to put them on trains, and the trains used to travel all over Western Europe. And you never supposedly knew where the train was, so they couldn't bomb it. But the engineers hadn't calculated properly because the train's bouncing fucking up and down. And so it, it, it's disintegrating uh, the information. So I came up with an idea how to store it uh, better. And uh, I won an award, and it was a $50 war bond, 50 bucks. If I held it 30 years, it was worth 50 bucks. You bought the bond for $6.75, and then in 30 years it was worth 50. And so I, my picture was in the Stars and Stripes, the military newspaper. And so I'm standing at the bar, and I, and I was fortunate because I, I, as a young officer, reported to two very senior generals. So Roy Atterbury, one star general, standing here, and uh, Woodrow Vaughn, a two star general, standing next to me. And Woodrow Vaughn turns to me and says, Danny, you should buy the drinks. And I said, yes, sir. And so I, I bought a round of drinks. But why? Because I always said yes. I never asked why. Never in my life to this day. So then the two-star general says, well, you know, you, you won that award. It was IBM. IBM award. So you must have money. I said, it's only $6.75 if I cash it in. That's two rounds of drinks at that time. And then he said, a young man like you could get rich in the civilian world. And a light bulb went off over my fucking head. Like a fuck, I mean, like an epiphany. A young man like me could get rich in the civilian world. I don't know, I don't remember looking up like this, but, uh, and I was out of the army in six months. Out. Now you'd still be spreadsheet. Well, what did the general really mean by that? How rich is, you, now, don't laugh, guys, because you know I'm telling you, saying the fucking truth. Well, how rich is rich? Well, my pension, if I stay 25, 30 years in the military, will be X. How many X's? And I just said, I'm out of the Army in six fucking months. I pulled the trigger. And the rest is history. He was right. A young man like me would get rich in the civilian world. And the rest is history, as they say. Okay, Andrew Carnegie, what else about Andrew? Yes, sir. There are no exceptions to financial motives must prevail. This is slightly untrue. There's four steps to financial uh, uh, freedom, according to Carnegie. Financial motive must prevail. Financial motive must prevail. Financial motive must prevail. And fourth and last, financial motive must prevail. That's it. There are, there isn't anything else. There isn't anything else. And most of you have read probably more than I know about Mr. Carnegie. But I'm here and you're there. As soon as I figured out what his model was, and he didn't call it a model, and there were no case studies, I just went back and looked at some of the J.P. Morgan shit and the other shit that he did. Fuck. Doesn't seem to be any equity in these things. 
And I looked at one or two more. No, okay. I didn't look at 100. I didn't look at 50. I looked at six, seven. No equity. First two or three deals I saw, well, maybe that's an error. Maybe it's a mistake. If after I saw six or seven, that's enough for me. Okay, I guess uh, we don't need equity. Okay, what else did he do? Uh, and he was always highly leveraged. Bank debt. And he borrowed money a couple of times from insurance companies when he was doing the railroad stuff. Um, and um, and he, he, at that time, he was doing 70-30. Sometimes he did 50-50. And then he would enlist uh, seller finance. And I said, well, fuck, you know, I, well, sounds good enough for me. And then I, only many years later did I go back and, why doesn't Goldman Sachs do this? Why doesn't J.P. Morgan do this? Well, because there's no real fee base associated with it. And, and the fees are what the banks make most of their money. Often. Advisory fees. Transaction fees. And it was simple. I started doing it for myself, i.e. Great Western. And then when I left, I got thrown out, unceremoniously got thrown out of my ass. Uh, I um, started doing it with QLA. And uh, I've told you this before. For the first five years, I, I did this. I was only going to do it from 93 to 2000. Then I was going to stop. Because I thought that everybody would be copying me. And Sally says, uh, nobody. And then I wait five months. Now I'm positive nobody. And especially since I tell exactly how to do it, still nobody. Why is it that nobody still does it? Why is it that nobody copied Mr. Carnegie 120 years ago? Yes, sir. Because they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe they can do it. It's just belief. Well, they, they don't, not just that, but the financial institutions that were involved but even back then and now were fee-driven. Why would, I, why would the bank recommend you do this when there's little or no fees? In some cases, no fees. Zero. They're not being disingenuous. They're just not giving you all the... They're not admitting or uh, committing uh, sins of, uh, of commission. They're committing sins of omission by not giving you all the information. And I'm, I'm convinced, you know, I, I'm 75 now, I'm convinced. I do this till I'm 80, this is going to be nobody. Now, there's a lot of uh, uh, mini-me's running around uh, that are selling stuff, but there's none of the big financial institutions. What else about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir. He was uh, beyond uh, ruthless. Uh, he said, uh, if you want to talk, talk to yourself. I want 18 hours a day and I will pay you less. One, one day of vacation a year. And I'm not sure he even gave that. And look at how, for, now, I'm not, I'm not saying child labor and all the shit that happened then. I'm not, I'm not trying to justify that in the least. The world has now moved on, right? And now we got civil disobedience, people, you know, in the streets and the blah, blah, blah. Okay. But back then and even now, uh, deals are getting done. And now, he died right at the um, end of Spanish flu. He died in 1919, Spanish flu arguably started at the end of uh, uh, 1917 and went through the beginning of 1919. He didn't die from the Spanish flu, as I understand, influenza. My grandfather, my, my father's father, who he never met, died from it in 1918. But they're still not doing it. They're still not doing it. And part of the reason, the more years that go by with it not being adapted, uh, you know, more or less internationally, the harder it will be because your board members will have never done a no equity deal. 99.999% of your board will have never done a no equity deal. So you got to get them over the hump first. And the first guy you got to get over the hump is your chairman. He's going to look at you. You know, what are you talking about? And then the accountants and the lawyers. You've got to get them over the hump. Because there's no equity in the deal. And the only equity that uh, we provide is uh, 
seller finance equity, rollover, rollover equity, whatever you want to call it. So it, it's that, that's difficult, and most people just have decided uh, not to bother because it is a harder sell. It's easier to do once you get going, but it's a harder sell initially. And people aren't looking for a hard sell initially. They're looking for an easy sell. And that's why no, virtually nobody does it. And it's not taught at any of the schools. At least I'm not aware of it. What else about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir, Doc. You would disclose that strategy at the latest as possible to the chairman? No, no. You, no, no, not latest possible. I mean, earliest possible because you don't want, you don't want him to all of a sudden, we've had chairman that all of a sudden they, they're in the deal and they see, they'll call up the U, or they'll, well, however they contact you now, and I don't understand, what am I missing? And he doesn't want to embarrass himself in front of the other board. What am I missing? Who's got skin in this game? Uh, Dr. So-and-so, uh, no one, actually. You know, and we've had chairman quit. Just, I didn't understand that. I, you know, I, I didn't want to waste your time, but, but uh, I don't feel comfortable doing that. We've had, we've had chairman, that's why you got to tell them up front. Remember, you got to set, frame it from the beginning that there's no, there's no equity. Remember, we're, when we're recruiting them, we don't, we don't want your money, sir or ma'am. Uh, we want your time and expertise and maybe five or ten hours uh, a month vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, phone conversation, Skype or whatever you call it, to uh, keep us on uh, the path to uh, uh, closing a deal. And they, they'll understand that. And again, the board understands the failure in the beginning better than you. They understand 95% of all deals initiated don't get done. They know that. They know that because they've been doing deals. Even when you're IBM or, or uh, British Petroleum, most of the deals they start never get done. That's why an M&A team at British Petroleum probably looks at 100 deals a year, they start 20 deals a year, and they complete three or four deals a year. Yeah. Uh, I've read in, in some of the comments or whatever that some board members actually realized what, you know, what they were doing and then, and then either start doing it themselves uh, or they drop the out. Steal the deal. Steal the deal. That's the close. But since Nick. you brought it up, who else would bring it up? <laughs> who, I mean, I rest my fucking case, you know? Okay. They do. We've had deals stolen. Um... Okay, you're in uh, London. You're walking down uh, Piccadilly. Okay, Starbucks. There's a bunch of Starbucks. Well, you're Starbucks. And as you walk by, you see your chairman, your CEO, and your CFO sitting having a coffee. You, you don't know about the meeting. Now, I know what almost everybody in this room would do. Keep walking. Do you think anything good is happening at that meeting vis-a-vis -vis you? No. One of the principal rules that we have, and again, I normally do it in the clothes when I'm jumping up and down and crying and screaming, I know what you can do, but I'm going to do it now, not jumping up and down, not crying, is that no fucking meetings that you're not in attendance. None. No correspondence, unless you're copy. None. First time they do it, they're gone. And then, the, 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 well, I mean, don't you trust us, sir? And so, well, I know you. Well, better answer is no. I just want to be apprised. I'm new at this. I want all the information so I can better lead. No, I, and then they'll say you don't trust us, really. But uh, yeah, because you do want all the information. You're going to hear Peter this afternoon. Somebody asked him the question. Well. Uh, you couldn't have had time to go to all these meetings, and then Peter, the only time he ever gets kind of aggressive in the webinar, I went to every single meeting, every second. When they went to the bathroom, I went to the bathroom. Until you do a couple deals. Until the board understands what side their uh, uh, bread buttered on. I, I, I think that's a saying, anyway. And after the first couple deals, then you are the rainmaker now. 
then they'll, you know, oh, fuck. I didn't rate the kid worth a shit, but we've done, you know, I'm a million euros up now. Then it's okay. But no correspondence, no nothing. Now, some of the kids don't allow the board members to, to, to congregate before that first board meeting, or talk, swap, spit, have coffee, blah, blah. Some of the kids, you know, when you list in your uh, executive summary, it's going to be Joe Jones, former uh, uh, finance director, CFO at British Petroleum, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's, you know, between, uh, even if you don't list his name, between uh, 1987 and uh, 1996, well, it's pretty easy to go Google who the chief financial officer of British Petroleum was during that time frame. I like to keep them, well, people accuse me of, Pena treats, treats us like um, mushrooms. He keeps us in the dark and shits on us. That's a bit of a stretch, really, but not much of a stretch. Because until there's a deal to discuss, uh, you know, there is no strategy here in the beginning. There is no strategy. All there is is the execution of getting a, a deal done. Um, and most of the concerns, not all of the concerns, but most of the concerns of the board goes away after you do a deal. Yes, in the back. Sorry, I still didn't get the answer. So what do you do to stop them from nicking your deal? Once they know oh, that there is... I, 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 no, Sorry. I, I, no, no. Well, th there's, there's no way. But you've got to make sure that they understand that you believe in litigation as a business tool. Veiled threat now, being more PC. Veiled, but a threat. Now, anybody that's in business with me knows... You know, I will kill your cats, goldfish, sue your mother. I mean, you know, vengeance is mine, saith Pena, not the Lord. Huh? NDAs are, you know, they're not, normally not enforceable unless you want to fight in court. And most people don't want to fight in court, so how good is an NDA? And... Your, your board members have a fiduciary responsibility not to steal your goddamn deal. That doesn't mean that it doesn't still happen. And the kids that get the deals taken from them are normally the young kids. There's no age, I have no demographic, but normally the younger kids. Because the older guys presuppose, uh, well, this kid's not gonna fight or this kid has no money to fight, or combination of the two. Combination of the two. Yes, sir. Your board's there to guide you. When you do the contract to purchase a business, doesn't that go through the outside attorneys and accountants? Well, so on a smaller deal, the sale and purchase agreement can be done by your in-house. Okay? One, one and a half million euro pound deal, a small deal. You know, you, because as soon as the KPMG or the lawyers get involved, the minimum bill they're going to have each is 40, 50, 60 grand. But they do nothing. They won't say it's nothing. And even though all the documents are boilerplate, they hit a button, you know, and they pop out. Sometimes you'll get boilerplate documents with other companies' names on it because they will have forgot the fucking assistant or the intern will have forgotten to erase the name. So you'll get a contract for a company that did uh, something similar, you know, eight, ten months ago. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, uh, you know, uh, the, but, you know, 80, 90 percent of the documentation to do your first deal is all boilerplate, meaning they've done it countless times before. Countless times before. But, I mean, the, there's, there's, there's no way, uh, like this deal that the kid uh, from America, cybersecurity deal, the, um, he sent this out yeah, to the board to the board, so the other board members. But see, when, when the board members see that, uh, that we're getting close, uh, the, uh, most of them want to get in and take the deal from you before you engage your lawyers and accountants. Because then you might have reason, you know, I owe these guys $115,000, so then you may chase them. Um, or some of the guys, uh, technique, it's only happened once or twice, they tell you the deal's no good. And yet it stacks up vis-a-vis -vis what I tell you what a good deal looks like. 
and you scratch your head. And I said, well, I wonder why they said it's no good. Because they're going to try to do the deal without you. But even though that, that can be a problem, I mean, it's, it's, it's one or two times out of a hundred. It's, you know, it, it, it's not uh, the norm. But when it happens to you, it's 100%. It's like lightning hitting Lee Trevino five times, you know, and it does happen. And you have to be prepared. I want you to be paranoid until you get the first deal done. What else? Anything else about uh, Andrew? Yes, sir. I think it would be safe to say you really wouldn't want to be poor in New York or Pennsylvania in those days. Um, the drop-off between... Um, being wealthy or um, uh, health, health and, and hygiene to being to being in the lower class was the difference between life and death. And contrast that Back to in those today. Days, kids, families died in the streets from starvation, etc. So I just I think a reflection that I have, or 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 um, you know that that now there's an element of comfort. Um, in, in, in people earning, you know, thirty-five thousand dollars, they can have a, an element of comfort and help. Most of you have not made changes here to, before today because you've been reasonably comfortable. Now, your comfort zone and my comfort zone are on two different planets. Okay, so but you know, if you're able to feed your family, you know, uh, drive a, a decent car if you drive. Uh, go on, uh, you know, uh, holiday uh, yearly. Uh, uh, I, I I knew kids in my neighborhood. They went on a holiday every three years. I still it just made me think. I haven't thought of this in years and years and years. Every three years, they saved up for two years so they could go on holiday. Uh, the um, so, but you're comfortable. You're comfortable. And now the kids coming out. I uh, I didn't believe that. Student debt was a big problem until the last four or five years when I see the kind of debt a lot of kids come away from from being students. People in their 40s still paying off fucking student debt. And, and, and that's a big problem. But once you get out of your comfort zone and you learn to push yourself out of your comfort zone, making your first cold call, except for a couple of you that have been involved in sales, um, won't be easy. I had a really polished sales guy several years ago, um, polished insurance salesman, and they're pretty well trained. And uh, his wife told me later, I mean, uh, uh, Robert look, sat and looked at the phone for 30, 35 minutes, just looked at it. And then finally she says, pick up the phone, you cunt, or I'm going to call Mr. Pena. Uh, and this is a polished sales guy, but he's selling something new, you know. He's not selling a whole life, $100,000 whole life insurance policy. Um, but, and you heard the, the uh, student, the young student, uh, the first uh, webinar you listened to, he says, I shook and, you know, and uh, I was nervous. Even the best sales guy in the room will be nervous the first time you make an absolute new Sales pitch the first time, you know. Uh, uh, there's, there, who, who's the cash and carry guy? Somebody's cash and carry. No, okay. I thought they were cash and carry. Anyway, there's a company called here Booker PLC, which is a big cash and carry. They're the largest provider of uh, food outside supermarkets uh, in Europe. Booker. What? Yeah. Well, now, well, now it is. Well, we, we tried to do a hostile takeover 20 years ago. And, uh, and Goldman and everybody was involved, uh, and uh, they couldn't get it done. In, in those days, the Guthrie Group, you hired the Guthrie Group, a deal that can't be, get done, you bring it to us. We'll do, instead of a 500-page McKinsey report, we'll give you five pages. Instead of five million, we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time on it for half a million. That was our sales pitch. That was our unique selling proposition. And we had ex McKinsey guys part of the Guthrie Group. And so they brought us in to look at this deal, uh, the Booker PLC. And this is all public. The disclosures this expired 10 years ago, so I can talk about this. And, um, and so uh, I said, uh, well, we had, you know, 
40% of the big shareholders, we had gone around and said, that, would you support blah, 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 a takeover of PLC and a change of management? And they said yes, but we didn't have over 50%. And uh, so I said, uh, well, this is going to live or die on who's going to be the CEO of this new entity. So I said, who have you called? Who are the top five prospects to take this deal over? Uh, and hostile. Not everybody wants to get involved in hostile, i.e., uh, Warren Buffett doesn't engage in hostile deals. Okay. So they, they gave a list, and I said, uh, well, what, have you contacted them all? And he says, yeah, all but, one, uh, all but one. And so I said, well, why not the one? Well, we know he would, he would say no. His name was Ken Hanna. And I said, you're positive. Yeah. He just stepped away from uh, liquidating Safeway, and he got a $2 million, a $2 million um, pound bonus, so he, he's not interested in making any money. And $2 million pound is nothing. Anyway, so I said, well, I want to talk to him. What's his number? Well, nobody's got his number. And then somebody in the way, the way we were in the back, he says, um, yeah, I, I, I went to school with him. I could probably have his number in an hour. So we wait around, 40 minutes later, comes back. And I said, would you please dial it? Now, this is the first cold call I had made in 10 years, maybe. Ten years. And a room, twice as many people as this, all financial professionals. And so they're dialing the phone, and I'm thinking, okay, you're on, you're on, you're on the stage now, Dad. Now what are you going to do? And so I said, I got through the first, and we're going to show you today after lunch how you get through the gatekeepers. I get to the people that are paid to keep you from talking to them. Secret sauce shit that YouTube will never know. So I get to the first gatekeeper. I get to the second gatekeeper. And now, now it's, it's 20 to 5 on Friday. There's no Brit, British executives in their fucking office at 20 to 5 on Friday. Now, there's a, I, I just was told there's a bank holiday on Monday here. That means they left on Thursday. So um, I finally get in, and I said, this is a personal nature. Uh, then I gave the special sauce, which I'm going to tell you that's not on YouTube. I got through to him. And I said, Mr. Hanna, um, I know it's Friday afternoon, but I have a proposition that uh, could easily make you 50 million pounds. Are you interested? Who is this? How'd you get this number? He says, yeah. I says, well, I can see you Monday. I said, no, I can be there in five minutes. I was 45 minutes away. By jet, I couldn't get there in five minutes. And he says, okay, I'll hang around. And he says, do you drink coffee or tea? I says, I'd like a drink. I said, okay, well, I'll have whiskey. So I got there 10 minutes after five, literally perspiring, had a run from my limo because we got caught in traffic. And then I, I pitched him and he said, uh, and he said uh, I'm surprised nobody's contacting me about this hospital I'll takeover. He said, well, they assumed that you wouldn't be interested because you just made two million pounds. No, the fact that I made the two million pounds makes me more hungry. And so we explained the deal to him, and he was interested. And so we proposed the hostile takeover with Ken Hanna, the chief executive. Chief executive. Um, and uh, the, uh, but just because nobody had made that call, and yet there is a room full of financial professionals. Guys at Goldman Sachs don't make cold calls. Guys at J.P. Morgan don't make cold calls. And the reason why, like this deal that I just described to you, this uh, cybersecurity deal, he, is through a cold call. Okay, what else about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, in the back. He got really, really hit by seeing his mother struggle. I think that left a long-lasting impact in him. Correct. And his mother just wanted to be, go in a carriage and drive down the town where they left in, in uh, humbly uh, years before. Um, and we all marched to the beat of a different drummer. I finished university when I didn't have to because my mom wanted me to be, you know, she came across illegal alien. She wanted me to be the first to have gone to college, university. Even though it was a college you didn't have to explain about, but, you know. Mayo Clinic, you don't have to explain about. Okay? Uh, the, uh, but the, uh, the clinic in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you've got to explain about. 
But some of you are here because of some other regret, guilt. And unfortunately, if it worked, if, if, if uh, love and prayers worked, they don't. Even though I pray, you know, just in case, you know. Uh, well, okay, what else about, um, yes, sir? He controlled costs and tracked efficiencies in order Correct. to become he big. He kept people accountable. And he, uh, we haven't brought it up yet, but I mean his uh, couple of people that helped him uh, in the beginning, he shit on, you know, left him for dead. And I'm sorry to say that's the way it is. Since I turned 60, in addition to uh, downsizing all the stuff that Sally and I own, owned then, is I've gone back reaching out to find people to help me in my career. I, uh, you know, I just found uh, one uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah, but not now. Okay. Uh, I reached out. Uh, I hadn't talked to him in 50 years, but he had helped me. Uh, and um, the, a lot of people don't get back in con When you're really successful, a lot of people don't uh, keep track of you, or they keep track of you, but they don't talk to you because they're embarrassed they haven't accomplished a fraction of what you've accomplished. And I was already uh, high profile. 1983, I was Hispanic Man of the Year, which that and... Five dollars, buy you a cup of coffee means fuck all nothing. I was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. The new Latino breed of wealthy. And it was my picture on the front page of the uh, LA Times um, in, the, uh, in 1983. So, people have, so a lot of people stopped. You know, they just, well, we had nothing in common. I remember meeting some guy at the Oklahoma airport. And he says, well, uh, I'm talking 25 years. And he says, well, you know, we've got nothing in common, but, I mean, what would you want to talk to me about? And th that'll happen to you. Um, anything else? Now, we're going to talk about your obituary, your goals and affirmations later, but uh, YouTube, see you later.